Deep listening. الاستماع العميق. Deep listening. Intensive to hear. Deep listening. Deep listening. Shen du ling ting. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. Well, what's interesting about um, the both books that I've written is the focus on listening being at the heart of what I learned. So it's they're they're about note taking. Lots of people sort of have this perspective that it's about the drawing part of it, and I think that's important. The sketch noting is part of part of it is drawing, but I've come to realize uh, pretty quickly that actually listening is the real s- secret weapon of sketch noting, and I think that's what people learn when they start to do it. So. I'm happy to give, sort of give you the origin story of how I stumbled onto the sketch noting thing, gave a name to it, and then how it sort of changed my life. Uh, but I think I've discovered that sort of listening, then because I'm listening well, or I feel like I'm listening okay, it allows me to form an analysis of what I'm hearing so that I can then draw it and do the things that I like to do visually. But at the heart of it is this ability to listen and process and then make sense of what I'm hearing. So I can, if I look at it again in a year, I've got a reference that I can pull from or that, you know, if someone sees it, they can make some sense, heads or tails of it. In this episode of Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words, we have the opportunity to hear from Mike, a user experience designer, an author, and the creator of a fascinating listening language called sketchnoting. Mike's created a way to help people listen to the essence of what's being said. He's created a global community and movement to help people free themselves from the detail and focus on what really matters in the conversation. I love listening to Mike and the way he described how he created this community by himself and now has passed the community on to others who are leading it. Our interview with Mike was quite playful. You'll hear lots of background noise. He's a big family man, and we wanted to make sure you heard from his dog as well as his children and his family there too. It wasn't too distracting for me, and I'm sure it won't be too distracting for you. So let's take some time to listen to Mike talk about sketchnoting. Deep listening. الاستماع العميق. Deep listening. Intensive to hear. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening, impact beyond words. So, Mike, growing up, who was the best listener that you experienced? I think it actually was my father. And this surprises me to say this because my initial reaction was my mother, and she was a good listener as well. But I think my father was much, much more perceptive about the details. He would listen to details that you would speak and sort of parse them in a sense. And as a teenager, maybe that wasn't, you know, <laughs> always a good thing. He would find things that you hadn't intended to say, but in your speaking, he would pick them up, right? He was, and I think it, um, I would also say that he was a good listener because he was a very good observer. Um, he tended to be a good troubleshooter because of his business. He was in electronics and troubleshooted le- electronic devices. And so his, the way his mind worked was to observe things before he ever would speak to someone. So he would sort of start forming an opinion by observing. And then part of his observation was asking questions and sort of letting you sort of explain what you were thinking, what your perspective was. And often you wouldn't really realize how much you were were revealing to him by simply asking these questions. So that would be sort of as I reflect on it, why I would say my father was really good at listening because he thought of it in the broader context of overall observation. And what gift do you think he shared with you that you take forward as a listener? You know, I think uh, actually that that perspective is also something that I've picked up from him that, that he's passed on to me is sort of an awareness um, of others. I notice, I tend to notice things that a lot of people don't notice or I'll bring things up that people are surprised that I've observed in them. Uh, as a designer as well, uh, one of the most powerful tools that I have is this ability to observe and sort of look for incongruities, so things that don't match up and wonder why they don't, and then sort of go deeper to solve that problem or 
actually congruencies, things that seem like they should fit together, but no one's seeing that connection. And then I have the opportunity to make that connection. Thinking about school and college, is there a teacher who you looked up to and went, wow, the way they really listen to me? Hmm. There were a few in my college years specifically, and that's uh, I, I would say that's probably the most formative in some ways because it really set the direction of my whole career and the life that I've had since those those days. Um, there's one person in particular who uh, I felt like listened more. In this technical college, there was a belief that cross-training was really valuable. So having knowledge about photography as well as printing was valuable for a designer, but not in just one direction. So printers needed to understand what photographers and designers went through and so forth, right? So each of them would go through each other's program to a limited degree so they would understand. And so I was doing that. I was in the design program for these one or two courses uh, and really um, took to it. And I didn't even see it myself. Some of my other friends actually were recommending that I should become a designer. And uh, when I got to the program, uh, I discovered this Howard Austin, who was a, he was a DJ at night on the public radio station playing jazz. So he was really cool. He drove a Corvette. He just had impeccable taste. Um, but I, what I found was actually under this cool exterior of this cool guy was actually a very aware person. In a lot of ways, um, if I now that I've made this connection with my father, like this ability to observe, it didn't take him much to observe when we were faking it or when we were really doing good work and he would call us out on it and challenge us to do it. And I, and I remember that um, I think my final project in his design course was something that I stumbled into and became very passionate about and did really well in. And it was, um, I started researching Leica cameras. I'd been fascinated with photography, I think because I did this crossover um, and just was really fascinated by Leica. I, I knew I could never afford one, especially as a student in a technical college, but it, it, there was no reason why I couldn't be fascinated by this topic. So I ended up doing research and producing a slideshow, an audiovisual slideshow at the time. And it was all handmade, um, uh, I guess, illustrations and uh, collage that, that I produced the slides with. Uh, and I just remember that he was really pleased with the, all the level, level of efforts that I did. And I, I could definitely tell that I was trying to please, you know, him and sort of reach his level. I sort of saw him as if I make it through this school, which I felt good about, he would be the level of quality, minimum level of quality I would try to impress on the outside. So he sort of represented for me, say, an art director in an agency where I might apply for a job. So he was in a way a proxy. And uh, but I always appreciated his um, his his observation. He could be tough at the right times, but also very understanding as well and sort of encouraging. So he he was he had that full breadth of ability. And what's really great is later in the later years after I'd graduated and gone to the profession, I was invited to be part of uh, I was invited to be a board member on the on the group that actually advises the school and making their curriculum stay current. And I got to know him as an adult, as a peer. Uh, and that's later on is when I actually found out that he was really impressed with my work and very proud that I'd come through his program. And Deep listening. Deep listening. Tiefes Zuhören. Deep listening. Mike, zoom us into your office and your work and facilitating a group of people to listen to what the users actually need as well as the organization. Take us through the process. Well, I think um, anything like that would would first begin with um, creating some kind of a script that we would actually test the users with. So in user-centered design, which is sort of the space I inhabit, I cross over some boundaries. So I go all the way from the user testing all the way to designing the interface and actually helping produce it. I'll work with developers to make things look right and work properly. So that whole spectrum of um, design is sort of the space where I work. So often in the case of user testing, we'll, we'll lay out a script of the things. What things do we want to discover about our application? And we'll sort of make a, we'll set some goals out. And then we'll work with the researchers that actually run the event uh, to formalize that script and then gather people 
we'll do it. We'll run a test with, I don't know, eight to 10 people. And they will actually use the application and talk through the things that they're observing. And so there's someone writing notes and we'll record them as well. So we can actually stitch together videos for the team later. So we'll go through this for, you know, five to 10 people. Typically we'll gather information and we'll sort of look at what are the patterns, what are the things that we found that were surprising to us, either in a good way or a bad way, uh, that help hopefully help us lead us to um, to finding solutions. So by the time we get to a meeting like this where we're showing the results, we may have taken the video and cut it down into a maybe an hour or half an hour video that we can show the team so they can actually see people struggling with the software that they've built. Uh, we find that's really valuable to have the people developing the software actually watch people doing well or struggling with the software because then they they have this empathy, they have this connection with the person that's actually the end user of their tool. Because so often it can be such a nebulous thing. We can imagine this person doing this or doing that when maybe they don't do this or do that at all. So it's good to actually see the reactions of people. And especially when it's repeated, if it's say something we thought was great, but the users found not working right, to see it repeated that way is uh, valuable. So often we'll we'll show a video and then we'll have a discussion. We'll talk through what are maybe some of the problems that, that we saw and how could we maybe start to solve those things and have a discussion around that. So that would be a session like that, that we might, that we might uh, have, have with the, maybe the whole team often with the whole team, we've done those types, types of events. I would say the other thing I'll mention is um, I facilitate um, what we call whiteboarding session. And what that is, is um, it's sort of the, the action that we do before we do that testing. So maybe on the front end of the whole design process, Mike, listening to what's unsaid is really powerful and quite often transformational. Can you talk us through a situation where one of your end users or employees just noticed something really different that had a transformational impact in that design process around the software? I certainly can. I think specifically of a test that we ran. So we, um, we've we run um, three or four tests on the software um, in this particular test. We wanted to see how the interface was working. Did people understand it? Were they being, uh, were they able to figure things out? This is one of the first tests that we ran, uh, and we had certain specific goals that we wanted to find out about. And as the as the users started going through this, they were remote, so we we could hear them. In a few cases, we could see them, um, but we we had a few that were also in person. So we've got a, a mix of both. Um, we had certain tasks that we set out for them to do. And I was listening in for the most part. I didn't speak very much. Occasionally, I would answer questions. So I was just observing. And the thing that actually surprised us was the 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 closing of panels. So in this particular software product, we have sort of a form in which you fill out the information that you want for your the insurance product you want. And once you've filled it out sufficiently, you press a button and then it reveals what the product will look like, the costs. It gives you a ledger of information. Um, it can even do charts and so on. And the way we would present that is we actually thought, wouldn't it be nice if it was just a single page, page application with panels that would come over and show information as needed? So if you press a button, an action would bring a panel over and show you something. Or um, if you went backwards, it would actually show you something with these panels. And we had, I think, three or four panels that would come in from either one side or the other. At the time when we built this, we had this idea that people would pay attention to which side the panels would come in from, either from the right or from the left. And so, therefore, we thought, based on that, we would use a symbol, a chevron symbol, sort of like a half tri uh, two sides of a triangle, to sort of indicate which way the panel would go back into the software, right? So we had built this intricate, nuanced, you know, directional indicator for people. So when the panel would come out, you would see a chevron going one direction or the opposite direction, sort of suggesting that it was going back in the same way. What we found was it was actually very confusing for users, and it was not something that they specifically pointed out. They would just simply get lost. Like, I don't know how to close this panel, Mike. I don't know what, what should I do next? Uh, and we would say, well, what do you think would be the next thing that you would do? Like, the, the trick of user-centered design testing is you sort of can't give them the answers. You have to let them struggle. That's where the gold is. When they struggle, 
that's when you start to see revelations, especially if it repeats over many people. Every single one of the people got confused. In many cases, they simply gave up. They got to the point where we had to tell them how to get out of this out of the situation because it was so unclear to them which way the chevron went or that the chevron was even something you could click to return. Like it was such not a universal symbol. And so we we regrouped after getting this feedback from all of the users basically that we have a real problem. Like we have these panels coming out and people don't know how to close them. That's a serious problem in an application. So we we immediately sat down and, and reviewed it, and we, what we realized was we could have gone much simpler. We simply switched all those Chevron symbols to X's, close X's, just like on every Windows or Mac or many other applications. It's a, it's a universal symbol. We don't know why we didn't think of this. We were so focused on this intricate, nuanced thing showing directional, but no one was really paying that much attention and it was not a universal enough symbol for them to recognize. So once we placed the the close symbol, the the ability for people to recognize it on the on the very next test, no one complained about it. It was very clear. Everyone was able to close those panels. No one ever had a problem. No one ever got stuck. And it was just shocking how much one little icon on a page could really make that much difference. And it was all through unsaid things, no one said specifically that, hey, that Chevron is confusing me. It was, I don't know what to do next, right? It was it was even more basic than that. It was simply unknowing that made it clear, like, we, they don't know what's going on. And as we, you know, obviously, as we asked them, like, what thing, what do you think, <laughs> what do you think would close that window when they couldn't find it? It made it very clear that we had the wrong icon. A powerful example of listening to what's unsaid for user experience I sense there's decades and decades of wisdom in your work, and uh, you, you've brought that together over two books so far, and I'm sure you're working on number three, if I, if I, if I get a good sense of you already. Talk us through how you came about to listen to what the communities around you were saying to bring this book together. Hmm. That's an interesting perspective uh, to ask me from. I had been, I had been frustrated of my note-taking about my note-taking for several years before. And it came to a head around the end of 2006 when I uh, I sort of faced the challenge. I was a very good note-taker, but I hated taking notes. It's a really bad place to be, right? Um, I took these giant notebooks I wrote in pencil so I could fix my mistakes. I wrote everything down. I felt like I had to be almost like a court reporter or something and document everything. But the problem was when I got done, I didn't want to look at my notes. It was just too much information. I didn't want to analyze it. And I had this idea that maybe what I should do is actually the opposite of what I had been doing. Instead of a big book, maybe I use a pocketbook. So I literally can't write everything down. It sort of takes me out of that conversation. Now, what if I switch from a pencil to a pen, which puts me in a place of committing to the things I put on paper? Right, that combination of those two things led me to a third thing. When I actually started to put that those ideas in practice, I went to a conference to test the theory, which has sort of been my approach to things. I'll have an idea and I'll test it. And it was, I took a small notebook and a gel pen and I went to a design conference just to see what would happen if I approached it this way. And what I found was because I couldn't write everything down and I had to commit, I was much more careful about what I put on the paper. And it sort of moved moved me into this different type of listening. In the past, I would listen for every detail, but I wasn't doing any analysis. In this new approach, because I had all this freedom and space and time, I actually had time to actually analyze the things that were being said and make decisions about which ones are worth me capturing, right? Because I'm going to a conference, I want to take something professional out of it that I can apply. And by, by actually analyzing in the moment, I only capture the things that I find valuable. And then I don't waste any paper on the things I don't find valuable. And then even after that, even after that ability to listen and analyze, I had additional free time where I could start to embellish. I could start doing lettering. I could start drawing pictures. If I had, as I was listening, images would pop in my head and I could draw them on the pages. And that's what I discovered happened. So that was the sort of the the start of all this stuff. And the most natural name I had for it was sketchnoting, and that name just sort of stuck and has taken off ever since. Deep listening. Ukulalela. Deep listening. Aktibong pakikinig. Deep listening. Deep listening. 
Oscar has identified the critical skill executives need to lead effectively, but which is often forgotten in a world where our attention span is defined by 140 characters. Deep listening creates trust and authentic action for leaders at all levels and is crucial to the development and retention of talent. This is a highly valuable book. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. The book creates a, a palette, it creates a syntax, it creates a language, it creates an iconography to help people to listen while they're note-taking. Just take us through how you've created this just most beautiful artefact to help people listen and simplify what they hear to what means the most equally allowing them to come back in years later and understand and place themselves exactly in that moment with extraordinary memories of that time. In my process, I started by writing the text first uh, because I'm very much a word person. We wrote the whole manuscript, had it checked. And then once the manuscript was finished, I actually sat down and did pencil sketches of the whole book from front to back based on the manuscript. Because as a an old print designer, that's the way I would approach a print project, understand the content and then figure out how to lay it out. And then within that, you know, the sketches were rough, so not every detail was in place. So when I got to the actual building of it, then I had a little bit more freedom to tweak and adjust. But actually, I've looked at the pencil sketches and they're quite uh, quite similar to the actual final book uh, in many ways. Not every detail, but generally speaking, uh, every page was accounted for and lots of the structure was already in place way back at the beginning of just laying out the pages. So then it was a matter of doing the illustrations, uh, doing the production work, which I did as a print designer, I had that advantage, and then coordinating samples of other people's work that I could feature in the book. So it was really important to me to, at this very first book, establish a community. I felt like community was really where, where it was at based on what I was seeing, seeing other people take this idea and take it in ways I couldn't imagine. It's very exciting for me. It still is. Every time I see someone do something new that I didn't think of, I get excited. I think it's amazing to see this the spread of the concept, but that it's actually adapting to people and not being so rigid that it can only be done in a certain way. You know, I think um, the aspect of the community that we've created, I'll say it that way, is um, that we are going back to the very first part of our interview. We're welcoming we're encouraging and we're warm. If someone comes in, you know, no one's going to be attacked for their drawing skills. In fact, they'll probably be encouraged that they made the step. Uh, people are very welcoming and giving. They reach out and they give when they don't need to. So there's really sort of a, a sort of a, a generous spirit around the community, which I I intended to do uh, when I started it, and I'm really pleased to see it continuing. And I think I think sort of. Uh, as you establish sort of a, a mindset, it sort of gets picked up by those in the community and repeated. And hopefully that's something as a part of a gift that I could give to them was this idea of being generous and welcoming and caring and wanting to make other people's lives better by the work that they're doing. That that's a really that would be an amazing legacy to leave behind. And the most extraordinary thing about it, Mike, is I can hear your father in that community, and I can hear Howard, your college teacher, mm. mm-hmm. in warm and yes. welcoming and encouraging, all those things that you talked about earlier on. So by careful listening, we have multi-generational impacts, and you can see the role that your father's played and also the role of the very cool Howard from your technical college mm. as well. Thanks for sharing that with us and, more importantly, with our listeners. You're so welcome. Thanks, Oscar. It's been uh, just a pleasure to be on and think about things in a way that I haven't thought of in different angles and perspectives. So I, I can definitely see your your skill in listening is uh, quite high and uh, you, uh, you challenge me to be the same. My pleasure. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Like me, I hope you felt the energy coming across. I had the opportunity to watch Mike as well as listen to him. 
The congruency between what he was saying in his body energy was so symmetrical. It was beautifully aligned because he's talking on a topic he's so passionate about. It was just lovely to see the smile come from his face, particularly when he talked about his college lecturer who pushed him a little bit more than he expected, the ever cool Howard. Mike's capability to create powerful artifacts and help people hear what they're not saying was beautifully demonstrated when he talked about listening deeply to the way they designed a set of user interfaces for the computer system and the insurance company, but they'd got it completely wrong. And it was only in hearing the fact that people were struggling and not giving them a solution that created a really simple way in design for them to make it easy for the users to use the software. And then I loved at the end where Mike realised that throughout the whole conversation with him, I'd brought together the fact that his dad and Howard, his lecturer, had all pre presented gifts to the community of sketchnoting as he's now started to take this movement globally. I just wish you could have seen how the state of Mike's face changed when I explained the connection between his father and his curiosity and Howard and his encouragement and all those things being beautifully role modelled by Mike as he curates this global movement of sketch noters that are helping people to listen beyond the words. Thanks for listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Lourdes LaSalle. Deep listening. Deep listening. Whakarongo Pohonu. Deep listening. Impact beyond words.